Thanks folks for coming to our second day of the Digital Data Conference on behalf of the Center for Media Engagement and the Media and Democracy Data Cooperative. I'd like to welcome you to uh, this Friday event sponsored by the Social Science Research Council. Uh, whereas yesterday in the Digital Data Conference, we focused mainly on digital data collection tools and analysis practices. Today, we're pivoting our focus to talking about digital data ethics, um, something that is really near and dear to my heart. As uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lazar noted yesterday in his keynote, digital data research and digital data ethics go hand in hand. And so I think it's really important as we think about these ethical practices to consider what approaches we're currently taking to collect and analyze digital data um, and what ethical guidelines need to inform those different approaches. We'll begin this morning with a panel of distinguished researchers uh, who are here to talk about their digital data ethics approaches in their own research and in their research centers. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Meredith Pruden of the Center for Information Technology and Public Life in the uh, UNC Chapel Hill, our moderator for the panel. Thanks so much, Joe. I appreciate that. I'm really happy to be here with this group today. Um, we are going to hear from five folks today, starting with Dr. Rebecca Trumbull, who is at the Institute for Data Democracy and Politics, IDDP, at George Washington University. Um, following Dr. Trumbull, we'll have Dr. Kate Starbird, who's with the Center for an Informed Public, CIP, at University of Washington, followed by Dr. Devon Shaw at the Center for Communication and Civic Renewal, CCCR, at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Joshua Tucker at the Center for Social Media and Politics, CSMAP at NYU, and Elena Christ, Internet Observatory, IO at Stanford. So without further ado, uh, take it away, Dr. Trumbull. Thank you so much, Meredith, and thank you, Joe. I just want to do a quick double check that everyone can hear me okay, um, because I just had to put headphones on as uh, I have kitchen renovation happening literally right beneath me, and I hear that the construction workers just showed up. So um, without uh, further introduction, I will jump into the topic at hand. Um, I, I, I do want to take just a minute to really thank the organizers um, and the SSRC for taking up these really important topics and particularly on the issue of data ethics today. Um, because I think that everyone on this panel and likely everyone in the audience is well aware of just how challenging the data ethics issues um, that, that exist for us in digital research really are. Um, and I think that it's important for us to, to really say up front that researchers, policymakers, really everyone across the board has been way behind the curve in figuring these things out. Um, we all know that our IRBs are very poorly equipped to address these issues. And quite frankly, as a larger research community, we haven't been doing nearly enough to help push these discussions forward and push for potential um, uh, revisions and change in these sorts of review processes that, that we're forced, that we have to undergo by law, but really we should be um, leading the charge in, in advancing the way that we're thinking about these things. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about how um, IDDP and I personally think about digital uh, data ethics. Um, and crucially, or, or sort of fundamentally, um, we tend to, I tend to um, think about this in terms of a balance between two core dimensions. One, the basic public interest in the work that we're doing. And then second, the individual data subjects interests. So we recognize from the very start of our thinking about data ethics that we have to balance these two things and acknowledge that sometimes they genuinely are in conflict with one another. And so we have to think through whether it's appropriate, how we resolve that conflict, how it weighs and where we draw the line um, in, in, in terms of whether we proceed with the research in, in the first case. Um, so let, let me start with the first of those two considerations. Um, questions about the public interest benefit of the work, right? The question really is how will our use of particular data benefit the public? 
Um, and so we tend to ask a series of questions. First of all, will it generate insights important for public accountability? Um, here we might think of, there are lots of different ways that this might play out, but we might think of platform policies, algorithms, et cetera, that negatively um, impact users or society. And if our research is going to help cast, uh, shed light on some of these issues, then it's going to be um, in the public interest. Another question we might ask is, will it generate insights important for policy considerations? So for example, right, might our research help point to best approaches for remedying some of the harms uh, that we know exist? And then finally, will it generate important knowledge? And here the concern is more with questions about basic science and how the research might drive knowledge forward, um, because we do view the advan advancement of knowledge as a public good. And in fact, that's um, you know, a view that is well enshrined in existing law, including regulations regarding human subjects obligations, and in Europe, even GDPR, right, the basic data uh, privacy legislation. Um, so if we ask these questions and we can point to, in answering them, point to clear benefits, then I think we have good reason to move on to consider the second dimension, um, which is the data subjects interests. Um, now this thinking, I will tell you um, personally, my thinking on this has, uh, has evolved quite dramatically pretty recently. Um, and that's because, um, as, as many of you know, um, I serve as chair of a working group that's been established by the European Digital Media Observatory in Europe um, that is developing a code of conduct for researcher access to platform data under GDPR itself. So under this major data privacy law, how can we spell out the sorts of processes and procedures that allow for safe, responsible, privacy preserving um, use of access to uh, platform data. And as we've been developing the framework for this code of conduct, we've come to uh, adopt essentially a two part risk assessment framework um, that allows us to to evaluate data subjects interests. So the first dimension in that framework um, points to the reasonable expectations or points to questions about the reasonable expectations of data subjects. Um, ultimately, right, it would be ideal if all of our research could be grounded in consent. And every place in which we can get to informed consent, we absolutely should be using that um, as, a, as an appropriate mechanism to honor our data subjects' interests. But we know that in digital research, that's not always, I, it's not always practicable. Um, so one of the other considerations that we think about is the publicness of the data. Now, I want to be really clear here that as GDPR itself explicitly says, and as many incredible scholars over the years have pointed out, simply because an item, a piece of data is public does not mean that we as researchers can treat it as fair game, right? As a sort of free for all for anything, uh, as an anything goes approach um, to that data. But we can, I think, think differently about the sort of relative publicness of different types of data. So for example, the uh, data subjects, um, if our data subjects are politicians, right, we should be thinking about the reasonable expectations of those politicians differently than we do uh, an individual um, uh, social media user uh, you know, who's just essentially average Jane, average Joe. The same thing with, uh, you know, influencers or other large accounts that are de demonstrably and purposefully intended to reach a larger audience. So as we start to, right, flesh that out, we have a number of different grounds for us to think about um, the relative publicness and the reasonable expectations of the data subjects for our use. The second dimension then of this risk assessment framework really goes to the potential harms. So here we think about things like the sensitivity of the data that we might be using. And we do have to keep in mind, and, and GDPR itself also makes this clear, um, that it's not just, you know, we, we're not just asking questions about 
whether or not our research topic involves sensitive subjects like uh, you know, certain political issues, um, uh, involves you know, race and ethnicity or health issues, um, but uh, whether some of that information might actually be present in the data itself. Um, and then the second but very closely related question that we ask uh, about the sort of potential for harms um, are the consequences for users' fundamental rights. So if, our, if in some way our own use of the data could be potentially harming the fundamental rights of, of those data subjects, then we have to really think very uh, critically about our own use of that data. Now, I want to say as I'm wrapping up here that this is not a perfect framework, right? There are still lots of difficult decisions that we have to make. I'm sure that we will discuss many of those. But just adapting and thinking through, adopting and thinking through this framework has been really, really instructive um, for how I think we can, we can move forward to really advance a, a more thoughtful, purposeful, um, and uh, re uh, um, responsible path for undertaking the sorts of research that everyone on this call, and I think most in the audience, um, seek to really drive forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Trumbull. We really appreciate your insights uh, related to data ethics. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Kate Starbird. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and thanks for inviting me to have this conversation today. And I just want to give some props to Rebecca for fighting through the noise in the background there. That was amazing that you didn't, <laughs> didn't lose your train of thought. That was really super impressive. Um, I'm going to share my screen just to have some guidance for the um, for the uh, notes I want to share today. Not super exciting slides, but um, hopefully will be helpful for me to organize my thoughts. Um, please let me know if you can't see them. Um, so uh, I'm going to speak uh, from our experiences at the University of Washington, the Center for an Informed Public, and some of the research that we've been doing there around, you know, how do we build ethical frameworks for social media research in the public interest? And to be honest, very selfishly, that's why I'm here today. It's like we don't have the answers. We encounter these questions every single day. And I think it's so important that we're, we're gathering together as a community because ethics come, ethical frameworks come from, from communities. And I think it's really important for us to, to share the kinds of um, questions that we encounter every day and how, and how we're navigating around them. To give a little bit of background on our research, I think it's important because there's different kinds of research in this space, like big quantitative research maybe has different um, limitations and possibilities in terms of the use of, of social media data. Our research actually relies on a lot of medium and small size data. We do mixed method analysis. We do a lot of, we do network things and, and, and look at patterns at scale, but we also look at like, you know, individual posts. We might read about an individual account to kind of understand who they are and where they come from. And that really does, you know, it, it, it completely relies on these digital data in order to do the kinds of work that we do. Um, and it's, you know, it opens up vulnerabilities and we understand that vulnerabilities it opens up because we study these folks and we say, well, this is a, you know, this is a person who we could really reveal a lot about them that could be damaging. And so I think um, it, it gives us insight of like, um, you know, some of the, dependencies of our research on, on this data and that it, there's a struggle for us as we understand those dependencies and we also understand that there's vulnerabilities there. A lot of what I'm going to say today is going to just echo um, Rebecca's comments, right? So um, the Institutional Review Board at our university is not up to this challenge to helping us. Like we, I beg them to look at some of our our, um, our proposals and they're just, oh, it's not human subjects. And, and, and they say, we understand that you have a gap here and we just can't fill it. You're gonna have to fill it for yourself. So our institutions are telling us this is public data as if we're like looking out a window and, and observing people in a public square. And yet we know that it's not. Um, and so, um, and especially around um, issues of, of consent, right? So we understand that research is about consent and um, in theory, these people may have consented to being in, in, in public, the folks that are using these social media platforms. We mostly, almost 100% rely on, on public data from, from, from Twitter or public pages on, on Facebook, those kinds of things. But even that we understand wasn't necessarily meant to be public, right? So um, the, the, these folks have in, certainly haven't knowingly consented to some of the uses of their data that we may be, um, that we, that may, we may be using in that way. And so, um, how do we protect those folks that may not have consented or understand that they have consented to this? Um, 
especially when we think about like some of the products that we might create, visualizations that might show networks that these folks maybe even didn't know could be visualized or didn't even know were there that may implicate them in things that are, are have rest, re, uh, reputational consequences. Um, and then getting to this thing that Rebecca called their reasonable expectations. Who has a reasonable expectation that their data may have been used in this way? Um, especially um, in the context that we study it right now is mis and disinformation, right? So, and, and in particular, how does this change in the context of disinformation? And misinformation, we know that folks can, you know, feel reputational costs for sharing a false rumor. But what happens when they get into this context of disinformation? And I may be speaking to the choir here, but just a really quick review, like misinformation is false information, but it's not necessarily intentional. While disinformation is false or misleading information that's seeded or intentionally or spread seeded or spread intentionally for a specific objective and it often functions of, as a campaign some individual or group of intentional actors who are attempting to manipulate or distort perceptions of reality through a set of information actions unfortunately historical understandings of disinformation will tell you that a large portion of those who spread disinformation are actually unwitting agents so people that get caught up in these campaigns but may not understand their role and who may be sincere believers of these claims. For instance, we've been studying election 2020 disinformation and the vast majority of the social media accounts that were spreading false rumors of voter fraud are sincere, appear to be sincere believers of that content. And what does it mean to be studying those folks in a way that treats them with care um, and also highlights the fact that there's this manipulation happening within those communities. Um, and so how do we protect unwitting agents, but also hold the manipulators to, a, uh, manipulators to account? And Rebecca talked about this as public interest. I would say the same thing. We've been beginning to th think about our work as being in the public interest and how do we weigh these concerns of like protecting those who, who are just caught up in things, but, but being able to, to, to demonstrate this mani manipulation because we think it has impact, potential impact on how the platforms are designed, the policies that guide them, and holding people to account if they're breaking the law, participating in criminal action or foreign manipulation of things like our elections. And so, um, so weighing those things is always um, something that we're coming across over and over again. And so we know there's this trade-off between privacy and transparency, and that becomes even more complicated in this context um, where exposing bad faith participants from provocateurs to elected leaders to state-sponsored state, state trolls would be very valuable, but protecting um, folks who get caught up in these campaigns is also extremely important. And so who gets to decide? How do we make those decisions? Um, and then it becomes even more complicated um, with this question. I don't know how many of us are experiencing this. I know we are, and, I, and, I, and I'm pretty sure a lot of us are, where journalists are reaching out to us to help them understand what's going on in some of these social media spaces. Sometimes it's because they need access to the data. And, and as researchers, we either have the know-how or we have the access through um, APIs or CrowdTangle or whatever it is to be able to see this data in the way that everyday people can't see it. Um, and so journalists are reaching out to us. And so we're, we're performing more, more and more as mediators between public in interest journalism and these data. And what does that mean? Because journalists and, and academic researchers may have different commitments to protecting privacy. We're, we're, we're protecting privacy. They're trying to investigate and expose the truth. And so there's these, these tensions there. So one of my students, uh, M M Melinda uh, ha uh, Hockey, has been, um, has been researching this and talking to journalists has a brand new paper at Kai kind of talking about some of these tensions, which really ends with a call for more ethical frameworks for us to be developing ethical frameworks to guide this work because it's been um, so stressful. Uh, and then, you know, there's these questions of who whose privacy do we protect, whose activities do we consider to be public. Um, what about the, pseudonym, uh, the pseudonymous leaders of QAnon? Are those people that we should be outing or helping journalists out or we should be hiding their um, their accounts. What about the repeat offenders of election disinformation, including sort of the, the president and his sons? Should we be able, would, should we be showing tables like this? We've chosen to show this table of, um, of high profile accounts that have been spreading, um, you know, that were repeatedly spreading voter or false voter fraud claims. We did, and if you go deeper in, the, in this list, we did anonymize certain accounts and we have certain rules of thumb around doing that. Um, but we're, you know, these are decisions that we're talking about every day and struggling with. Um, also, what does it mean to share products like network visualizations that may reveal these dynamics that users may not even know are there? 
Um, and we've left the nodes off of this graph, but they're fascinating, right? So we've been asked about, hey, there's some, there's some nodes here in this graph. These are the graph of election communication. There's some nodes here in this graph that connect sort of these, the socialist part of the graph with the far right part of the graph. Who are those nodes? Well, we know who those nodes are. They're very fascinating. Do we tell people about who those nodes are and what those mean? And when do we do that? And when do we not do that? And so we've been tackling these, these questions again and again and again. We have some rules of thumb we've developed a, about listing the actual uh, information for verified accounts, for public figures, for accounts with very high follower um, numbers. Like right now it's 250,000. That's something we probably won't anonymize. Um, and then we try to anonymize underneath that, but actually it's way more nuanced, nuanced than that when we start going case by case. Um, and then thinking about journalist requests of when we give raw data, when we give like, you know, we'll give some insights, but we will give some numbers, but we won't actually give them access to some of the data we have, even though they were in theory public. Um, and I just want to stress this thing is that ethics emerge from communities. And again, we're, we're struggling with this every single day where we, you know, in our Slack channels and our conversations, we're talking about, you know, different, different ways, whether we're writing a paper, talking to a journalist, or even as we're conducting the research, how do we, um, how do we do best by, you know, to protect the folks in this, in, in these data sets that, that really don't understand they're there, but at the same time, to be able to call out the manipulators who pur are purposefully hiding underneath the privacy protections in order to manipulate these systems. Um, and, and selfishly, again, I'm, that's why I'm here today. I'm hoping we can learn from each other and begin to build some foundations so we can feel like we're standing on some more solid ground. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Starbert. I love your um, call for community and working through these problems uh, and concerns together. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Devon Shaw. Oh, thanks. Um, I'm gonna share my screen as well um, and pull this presentation up. Can everyone see that? Great, thank you so much to the organizers uh, uh, and to the two presenters that proceeded and the ones that will follow because I, I suspect we're all gonna be hitting on the same themes and the same uh, 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 kinds of questions surrounding um, data ethics. And, and I think I'm gonna echo Kate to a great degree where a lot of what we do is ask questions about this. And it's, it's questions and that oftentimes lead to tensions that make us, I think that came up uh, in Rebecca's talk that you know these oftentimes the goals of what is the good are in conflict, and it makes uh, uh, trying to do this work that much more complicated. Um, and so I, I want to share insights certainly from uh, uh, the Center for Communication and Civic Renewal, which is uh, uh, the the center under which name I'm here, but I'm also involved with two other centers, and so I want to draw from all three of those centers for the insights I want to share today. Uh, um, and so. Um, in terms of the work of data ethics, the way I think if I were going to synthesize my understanding of it, I think about it at every stage in this process that we have to be thinking about it from data generation, collection, curation, processing, sharing, as well as the tools, practices, and publications we generate from the data. And so, you know, and I know there's deep discussions about artificial intelligence and agents and the types of, you know, biases that we create in machine learning algorithms and in simulations and, and, and even in questions of, you know, hacking to gain data access that are often around, you know, very uh, reasonable and important social questions weighed against, uh, um, you know, whatever legal or other kinds of safeguards uh, um, uh, people may be concerned about, or more importantly, how the biases in these systems can lead to, you know, uh, uh, downstream very serious problems. I think of computer vision and identification, for example, uh, um, and racial biases. So, you know, at every stage in this process, we have to think about this. And I think, how do we do that? How do we decide what is a morally good solution? That is one of the hardest things I think I have found. I have found it the discussions much more robust and thoughtful on the health communication side than on the political communication side, frankly. There's a much stricter IRB protections for medical subjects. And I think that forces a certain reflection on this process that I don't think happens as often on the we can scrape it and get it side of data science. Um, so the three centers that I want to just mentioned briefly, I'm the director of the MCRC. Uh, that's a center that is lots of different research groups, 
with lots of different faculty leading them, really centered around graduate training and creating a framework for you know, developing and training uh, uh, young faculty into the professoriate, but also to some degree into industry. And we've had many people go into places like Apple and Mozilla and uh, uh, Amazon and uh, 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 lots of other places in industry, Google AI. Um, the other center, which is the center uh, uh, I was invited here to talk about is the uh, Center for Political uh, and Civic Life Centered Work, which is the Center for Communication and Civic Renewal. Uh, uh, Knight funded, but also now NSF funded, and we have uh, uh, other streams coming in, including Hewlett and others. And then Chess, which is mainly NIH funded work. And again, as I said, the health technology centered work within Chess, which is the Center for Health Enhancement System Studies, has been, I think, where probably some of the insights that I've uh, 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 gleaned and, and the kind of frameworks I bring to the other settings uh, uh, sometimes have come from, from my colleagues in the medical sciences and, uh, uh, and their sensitivities. And I think across all three of these, there's a, a, a sense that deep technical expertise has to be matched with concern for responsibility to research participants, care in the collection and management of data uh, from those people, and then also their privacy and autonomy. And this informs all of our decisions. And again, you know, I say this partly because the groups we're working with can range from, again, uh, uh, looking at large scale political behavior around people advocating for gun control or gun rights in the public forum using hashtags where they want to be visible, right? They're purposely trying to be part of a public conversation by using certain hashtags and being part of a, 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 a public forum uh, uh, and advocating for a particular side. Um, versus, on the other hand, something like we're dealing with addiction treatment populations uh, 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 who we're building health technologies for, who we have to absolutely safeguard the privacy protections of and really think about this in a, in a very much centered around their concerns. What we can do to benefit society has to be weighed against not just what's possible to do, but what's good to do. Um, if I was going to talk about a set of recurrent questions across these teams, um, these would be the ones that I come back to. They're adapted from uh, uh, Lu and Yang. They're uh, 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 our own, I would say, in the sense that I think these cut across even more than, than some of the existing kind of checklists of questions that I've seen. Um, you know, have we considered biases in our data and how they affect our outcomes? Questions of fairness and how we're building. How, what kind of data in, data out questions, really looking at various stages, human in the loop, very self-critical, lots of validation. Does our team have a range of opinions, backgrounds, and perspectives, diversity? We're trying, you know, if we're doing research on topics, making sure those voices are present in the room. Um, and if not in the room, then in our literature and in, in the ways we're thinking about these questions. Do we seek user consent and how do we ensure, ensure it's informed? And I think this is again, again, a question that cuts across so many of, you know, just because someone, you know, uh, 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 signs, you know, when they sign up for Twitter says, yes, the data is available. Again, doesn't mean that all those users have an equal degree of publicness in their expression on that platform. Um, and, and I think that we have to recognize that, especially when we're dealing with sensitive topics. We deal with topics like Me Too as well, where, again, we've set thresholds for the kinds of uh, uh, levels of activity on an account before we'll deem it to be public or the types of activity they're engaged in. Again, if they're trying to engage in a public forum or a public uh, uh, exchange, then we treat it differently. Um, what do we do if people are harmed by our research or our results? And um, uh, you know, here I'll give an example of a study we were in, indirectly involved in. This has happened through the Chess Center, um, where it was a study in, in paneling young people to uh, uh, with with mobile phones with reminder systems uh, uh, if they had asthma to take their asthma medicines to give them updates about pollen levels and pollution levels. And within about uh, three weeks of study start. Uh, these young people were sexting each other and there was um, harassment happening on the platform. We had to shut the whole study down within three weeks. Um, you have to monitor when harm starts happening. We took this immediately to our IRB uh, uh, because this was, again, too concerning, right? It was 
we knew there was something uh, uh, very unfortunate happening within a system we created to try to reduce harm that was actually potentially creating harm. You know, have we tested for differences in performance across groups or cases? We tried to really think carefully about the robustness of our performance uh, across settings, and uh, uh, and you know, and are 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 thoughtful about that as well. Um, do we consider how our models perform over time? Right. So something we build today may not perform well in the future. We've built systems in chess. We've built classification tools and systems that perform well in a particular period of time or context that don't do well in the next period. And we've had to adjust that. Our, our uh, uh, multimodal coding for debates is an example of that. You know, uh, Donald Trump changed the rules of how debates are done. And now I think today or yesterday, Republicans dropped out of the debates, uh, uh, of the at least the debate commission. Um, again, we have to look at how our tools perform, that important insights. Um, and, and how do we plan to protect the security of user data? And this is probably one of the biggest questions when it comes to things like where privacy uh, uh, is not just important uh, uh, from the standpoint of research ethics, but also could endanger the life, could endanger the personal security. Uh, 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 police may be interested in it. There may be legal safeguards in place. We've had to have some very secure processes for protecting user data, again, when the levels of sensitivity are higher. Um, and how might research uh, uh, researchers, uh, or uh, 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 I'm sorry, how much, how might research or archive or tool that we build be used for harm or how could it be used for care and support? And so we, we always think about these questions. And I mean, again, across this, our interest is in, uh, um, is in trying to really not come up with easy answers, but just to ask more questions. How do we do this? We spent countless hours in meetings discussing these issues, including our graduate students, our research staff, all faculty investigators to wrestle with these ethical challenges. And again, as I mentioned, we've had to deal with like privacy versus beneficence for those in substance use recovery. We can, we have to safeguard their privacy, even sometimes at the expense of doing things that might be beneficent for them. Uh, uh, you know, correcting biases. We've had to do that when we've we've looked at the pool of what's been counted as a mass shooting and things like the Stanford mass shooting database. They exclude many mass shooting events that involve. Uh, 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 entirely black groups of people because they're coded as drug violence and treated differently for no real reason, other than that they're often at one location. They, they match all the characteristics of a mass shooting. They're just not discussed that way in certain databases. But if you go to the FBI database and look it up, you'll find them. Where do you have to correct your biases? It's oftentimes at the most basic levels of your data. And then again, thinking about things like uh, uh, how the data we create can be used sometimes in ways we may not expect. We just finished a book, Battleground, that talks about the Wisconsin GOP and some of the ways they were extraordinarily successful at distorting. You know, can that be a roadmap for them? It very possibly could, and something that worries me. Um, and so I'll stop there. I think I'm out of time and uh, uh, thank everyone. But the questions I'll leave you with are, what harms are we trying to avoid? What, what rights do we want to protect? What problems are we trying to solve? And what privacy do we guard? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. I really liked your um, list of things to consider. I hope we can um, dig a little deeper into those during the Q&A. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Joshua Tucker. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me here today. Uh, it's really kind of tough to go towards the end of this panel because I, um, I, I, know, I know all these people well, I respect them tremendously, and I agree with just about everything that they've said so far. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do here is maybe back off a little bit of not just the big picture topic of ethics and research. After all, I'm not an ethicist, and I don't think I'm the most qualified person to be speaking on this. But I'm going to try to use my time to talk about the issues I've been thinking about in the context of the research that we've been doing at the Center for Social Media and Politics and other projects I've been involved with. Um, so like Rebecca did, <laughs> I want to begin by placing the discussion of data ethics in a kind of larger context. Um, but rather than the whole question of ethics, which Rebecca was talking, I'm going to talk about the one that is the one that I've been focused, you know, coming face to face with the most, which I think is, is sort of been a huge issue in the discussions I've had about this over the last five, six years, which is the question of privacy. But I want to caveat 
privacy is not the only ethical question. So I'm going to dig, as you said, I'm going to dig a little deeper into, into one, one aspect here. But it is one that comes up a lot. And it comes up a lot in the context of data access from platforms, uh, this question of privacy. And so I'm going to sort of, uh, I, I want to start by just making this sort of bigger picture point, which is that Pro everyone who does this, I mean, I would hope everyone who does this research agrees that privacy is important. Um, but if we take the question of user privacy in the online environment to its fullest extent, then the ultimate way that we can keep data private is to make sure to never ever let it be shared with anyone outside of the platforms who have, fill in the blank what you want to say, collected it, own it, been given it, extracted it, but that, that's the ultimate extension, right? Like that that's where we get the highest level of privacy. Don't let anyone who doesn't work for those platforms ever see any of the data. Or it would also say, don't ever have researchers go out and collect any data. Um, the problem is, is that if we do that, if we say that all of the social media data that we're talking about here at this seminar today, is going to be kept in the most secure way to keep it the most private, if we're going to optimize entirely over privacy, then we get into a situation where those of us who don't work for the platforms don't learn anything about how society works. And it, we don't learn, you know, you could imagine this across other fields. We wouldn't learn how drugs work. We wouldn't learn how which government implementations of programs work. And in our cases, it, we wouldn't understand how platforms impact on society. And as Kate and Rebecca both mentioned and made cornerstones of their presentations, this is, of course, really, really important. And so privacy is super important, but there are other things that are important. And I would argue that one of the things that's most important is that we want to have public policy informed by rigorous evidence. Now, we know policy is always going to be some combination of a set of political preferences about what types of policies are the best policies that states should be implementing, but it's also going to be a function of belief about underlying reality on the ground. And what we hope is that, you know, that underlying reality on the ground will inform what people do regardless of what their kind of political preferences are. But this underlying reality on the ground is particularly difficult when it comes to social media research. Um, as I'll talk about in a second, my background is in post-communist political behavior. My first uh, book was on economic voting in uh, Russia, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic and Slovakia in the 1990s. I did not ever turn on the television and see round tables of people debating economic voting in Eastern Europe in the 1990s. But what we have here now is because social media is such a bright, shiny object, we have an entire kind of punditocracy, I don't know how to pronounce it, I made the word up, uh, ecosystem around social media, which means that if scholars don't step into that to try to have rigorous scientific evidence about what's actually happening here, it's not like no one's going to talk about it. There's going to be received wisdom. There's going. There's a lot of people who have made careers about talking about these things, and people will talk about it, and it will spread throughout the population, and policy will be made on its benefit, on its basis. So there are real costs to us not doing this research. And with social media, and in addition to the, the punditry right around this, the thing about social media is because there's so much of it, and it's optimized for search, you can find anything on social media. Right. And you could even do an in-depth study on anything on social media, but it doesn't mean that it's broadly representative. Right. And it doesn't mean that what someone has found that they found interesting is what should be the basis of, of forming policy or more generally, as Rebecca said, of advancing scientific knowledge of doing the kind of basic research that we as academics do. So my way of thinking about this, and which uh, we you know, finally put down and wrote out in this book, Social Media and Democracy, in the last chapter of that, which is available open access for anyone who wants to take a look at it, um, that I co-edited with Nate personally, in the last chapter that Nate and I wrote together, we sort of laid this out as a, to think about this as a trade-off, right? That it's good for society to know things, and it's good for people's privacies, privacy to be respected. And that if we want to think about the kind of ethical way to approach this trade-off, we want to think about optimizing over both of these dimensions. It's really easy in the heat of the moment as researchers to optimize just over the dimension of learning stuff. And it's really easy for privacy advocates to optimize just over the dimension of privacy. But I would like to push us all as a society, as a group, which sounds like, again, which I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, I think, to think about 
the trade-offs that we get here and to think about optimizing over both of these things together and to understand the, the, the distinctions of this. All right. Then what, I, what I'll do in the rest of my time is I want to just address three kind of more uh, specific points um, about things that have come up with our lab and one thing that was just brought up to mention to the panelists before. And the first is I want to talk about data security. Then I'm going to build on what Rebecca said a little bit and talk about public data with building on with Kate's remarks as well and Devon's remar remarks as well. And then I want to talk very briefly about leak data. Um, so the first thing on I, uh, data security, because when I was first asked to be on this panel and I thought, well, what am I going to talk about in terms of data ethics? I thought, well, you know, maybe this is going to be a panel about data security, right? That this is a this is an ethical responsibility. If we're going to try to collect this data, if people entrust us with their data, both if we're being collecting data that's public data or data that people have consented to us to collect, we have an obligation to ensure that it's only used for the intended purpose, which is research, right? This, in a sense, is you know, is the heart of the Cambridge Analytica standard. The scandal. You're told your data is being collected for one thing. You're not even told your data is collected for one thing and it's being used for something else. And if our data gets hacked or leaked or released, right, then we are not, you know, having our obligations to the people whose data we're analyzing. So I just want to say, you know, we what we did just to share this, this was supposed to be kind of sharing about practices. We developed a set of policies at CSMAP through an interactive inclusive uh, process whereby we talked with our researchers, we talked with our research engineers, we iterated over ideas about this. And I just wanna say, I totally agree with Kate's point that thinking about this stuff comes out of community and that the value in doing this in a kind of community driven way, different people have different eyes on these things, especially as we get into bigger labs. And what we did is we actually came up with a four tiered system within our lab. So we label lab either, we have data that's labeled as public data, that's data that we share inside and outside like public data sets that we make available on GitHub that other people can download. Some, we always talk about dashboards, we haven't done them, but someday we'll have dashboards, right? And we'll make public data available. That's the lowest level. Then we have data that's CSMAP data that's accessible to anybody who works in our lab. Um, and then we have these two higher level data where we call secure data and then highly secure data. And we've worked really hard as a lab to try to figure out what belongs in which category. And as you go from secure data, you have to get permission to access it. If you go to highly secure data, this is data that we're not gonna release. And these are, we have like card keys that we send to people for crosswalk files and things like that. So I think that's just to throw one thing out there. I think that we can do to do this ethically is to really think about, to take our data security seriously and having been doing this for 10 years and started this in the kind of wild west of like, oh my goodness, we can download Twitter data. I think this is a this is a positive development. I know it helps me sleep better uh, about thinking about our lab that we've put these policies uh, in place. On the public data case here, I'm just gonna, everyone has already said really, really great things about this. So I just wanna add one more point to the discussion, which I don't, I hope it, which maybe is a little provocatively, but not too provocatively, but I would argue that um, I want to make the case for why if digital trace data is shared publicly, it's fair grounds for research in aggregated versions. And by aggregated, I mean not the questions that Kate and Rebecca were wrestling with before, are we going to report that X said Y or X shared this thing. But I mean, we see Z instances of this phenomenon out there, timelines, you know, proportions, trends, sharing, networks. Um, and I and as a, and and at the aggregate level, I just think here's why I don't believe we can go down the road of saying we can't study things if people didn't intend for what they were doing to be used in research. I, I'm gonna I guess my, that's my, that, that's too high a level of, of of standard here. And the reason is I just want to come back to this as a social scientist, right? As I mentioned before, this first book that I wrote, it was about the effect of economic conditions on election results. Like to that, the all of the data for that book was either aggregate level economic data collected at regional level across five countries or aggregate level voting data. Like if we really went down the road of if people don't intend their data, their data to be, they do things in public and they don't intend that data to be used for research, we can never study election results again. Because most people, when they vote, they're not thinking of themselves as participating in a research study. We could never study educational outcomes. We could never study, in the case of this, anything in economics because unemployment rates are simply aggregations of individual people choosing to enter the workforce. When I get a job or not, I'm not thinking of myself of being in a research study. So that's just the one piece I'm going to add to this discussion here that I think at the aggregated level, that's a very, 
I don't think that that's a sustainable argument that we should only be studying things that happen in the public domain if people, when they engaged in that behavior, intended to be part of a study. That's not, I think, our role as social scientists. The final thing, we got some prompts before this about leaked data. Um, and I just want to say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to comment on the ethics of working with leaked data, um, although the moral hazard problem of it kind of worries me. Uh, but uh, I do want to make this the point I always bring up on this is on the science of leaked data. I get having dealing with with foreign adversaries and things like this. I get increasingly concerned that someday when after enough studies are done with leaked data, you're going to see disinformation campaigns conducted through leaked data. And I think there's a weird there is this sense that we treat leaked data somehow without the like like we were like, that's leaked. Therefore, it must be totally real, right? Like it was lots of other data. We're like, well, what is the measurement error? What is this? So I, that was my like one thought on leaked data just to throw out there. And then the final thing I just wanted to add it at the last second on, on Kate's thing about IRBs. Um, I completely agree with, with Kate's point, which is that, you know, the more I have done this, the more I become convinced that IRBs are fundamentally about preventing abuses in medical research. Right when people are subjects of given drugs or given therapies or things like that, and they have been grafted onto social science, um, and we 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 need a a sort of process. And 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 the other thing that I just have learned that I just wanted to share here is that like the more I go down this road, the more I think that not only are the IRBs not designed for social science in the first place, but they're very the way they are implemented just is very inconsistent across different universities. And it really becomes increasingly hard to justify that you can say, well, this is we have this is a standard if that standard is just not applied the same way. And Rebecca and I have been involved in this large scale research project for the last two years together where we had the same IRB go out to like 10 different institutions. And like that wasn't the point of the study, but it was very illuminative. Right to see how that handled because we realize the first you know you're always suspicious of this but I think that this is a this is a, the, the IRB system goes beyond the problems that have previously been identified here that Kate was said you know that Kate brought up in particular of it not giving us the answers to the questions we really need I think there it's also not fundamentally suited for large scale collaborative research and that's fine if you're CERN because you, if you're CERN and you have three thousand researchers working on a high particle collider, you don't have to put that through human subjects review. But as in the work that we all do here, and the work that Joe is is you know hoping to enable with her data collective and this amazing initiative here, this is more and more of an issue where we have these like IRBs going out to multiple. And if you have every IRB saying they've got to like deal with every amendment from every, I mean it becomes totally unmanageable. So I think that's another thing. I, I just wanted to, to two finger on. Kate's point that that's something else I think that we really do want to be addressing going forward. What kind of boards do we need? And if we're going to design this from scratch, a kind of ethical review process, let's address a number of other things like like let's make it not so dependent on universities and more, you know, uh, more enabling of collaborative research, which, as we know, also goes on again to Kate's point this also goes on with people who aren't at universities and that makes it complicated as well. So thanks very much for the time. Hopefully those are a few useful things to add to the discussion. Thanks so much, Josh. I think you gave us um, a lot of great prompts for the Q and A. Um, and last but certainly not least, Elena Christ. Thank you. Um, thanks, Joe and Meredith, for having me on this panel. Um, it's definitely tough to go last because, again, a lot of what I say is going to echo um, all of the people who've spoken before me. Um, but I'll try to hopefully add a few uh, more insights into this process. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Stanford Internet Observatory is a cross-disciplinary program of research, teaching, and policy engagement. Um, and we look at abuse of the internet in real time. Our work as a result ends up to being divided a bit into forensic style investigations into online narratives um, and information networks. Um, and then also a lot of policy analysis of internal and external platform regulation uh, as we try to think about how we can improve trust and safety through large scale analysis. The question today is on our approach to digital data ethics. Um, we're all a panel of academic researchers, which means that we are all subject to similar oversights from our universities um, and research institutions. Uh, you know, if we conduct research that involves human subjects, we first must submit our research for um, institutional review. And I have to say that as a member of Stanford University, who is responsible for a lot of why we all have to do review, I do think that uh, internal review processes are important, but I completely um, 
agree with all of the critiques and concerns that have been voiced by the other panelists. Uh, now, as they've said, much of the work that we do falls in this fuzzy space that is not always subject to IRB review. A large amount of our data comes through public or researcher APIs and contains public data that does not require review. Many of our outputs at SIO are considered non-academic. Uh, these include things like papers and blog posts. And for these outputs, uh, we kind of fall into a more nebulous space, but we try to follow best practices from our peers. So as Kate said, uh, was pointing out about anonymization, we're useful. We will share screenshots, say, of a tweet or a, or a post, um, but we only do that if it is explanatory, an explanatory example, and we try to anonymize any information for non-public figures. Now, that being said, we also train all of our students to be open source investigations researchers. And if you have these basic skills, uh, unless this is say an instance of uh, repeated posting of the same text, you can probably reverse find uh, who posted the original content. And this is something that we struggle with every time we choose whether or not to include a screenshot in a blog post or a report that we put out. As part of our data collection, we gather what can be personally identified data, usually in the form of usernames and profile names. So these are identifiable. For example, my Twitter handle is at Elena Chris. I don't think there are any other Elena Chris out there, um, but would love to meet them if they exist. Uh, if my Twitter handle were at John27834069, you'd probably have a harder time to kind of connecting that to me. Um, but fortunately, the way this data is structured, these are fields we can separate out if we need to. Um, but we collect them because they're part of kind of the public data that we're able to bring in. So, so far, I think this is all straightforward, um, but I wanna bring up a few newer data ethics considerations that we are also frankly still trying to understand and are debating internally. And I'm benefiting tremendously from listening to my peers on this call. Um, the first is about the impact of our work on society. We frequently investigate adversarial networks or products to better understand how they work. We may investigate a coordinated behavior campaign, for example, that is attributed to country X and targeting country Y. Our findings would explore the tactics in this campaign and how they were or weren't successful. And sharing this information uh, has value in helping researchers identify these tactics online and better understand them, but it also has the potential risk in that we could be giving ideas to adversarial actors uh, out there um, on, how, on new tactics they could be using or adapting. Uh, is this good or bad for society? I tend to think that awareness, the awareness it provides uh, to users outweighs the risk that bad actors may have, and bad actors often may have moved on to new tactics already. Um, so that's an example scenario. Here's a slightly more complex scenario. Um, a couple of my colleagues are currently conducting research on how well a new la large language model can replicate human generated content. The findings have the potential to shed light on the risks to society if disinformation actors begin using large language models for their campaigns, but the findings could also give disinformation actors ideas for how best to take advantage of these models. Is this good or bad? An IRB review is going to ask whether the study participants, uh, those would be the students we have coding whether or not the content is convincing or not convincing. Um, are being harmed in that process. And this is a relatively low risk study, but should the study have an ethical review for its impact on society and not just on the research participants? So in this case, it actually did. Uh, there was a newer internal process for this specific internal university funder that was supporting this work. Um, the researchers had to submit their work to try to better understand what societal impacts the study could the societal impacts of the study could be. Before the team received funding for this, they had to explain the benefits and risks to the ethics review board and respond to critiques of their statements. This process informed the experimental design. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the first time we've ever encountered it, but I think it's a compelling case for something that could exist that might help researchers that are grappling with issues in this space. Um, we are working with data that is personalized in different ways than ever before. Researchers have safely and ethically wrangled large identifiable data sets before, uh, data that oftentimes I think the participants weren't fully aware was public, things like IRS records, census data, uh, social security administration records. Uh, and now when they're working with that data, they go through intense privacy uh, screenings. They often have to be working on it on restricted or closed networks, um, but these are things that, that can be done. 
Um, what, sorry, um, but we still have an ethical responsibility to preserve users' privacy, but we can do that in a way and learn from their, that still teaches us about their online behavior. Um, we have a responsibility to access and store data securely and uh, to consider the personal societal implications of the publication. So I'm just gonna stop there and then uh, look forward to the Q&A. Thanks so much, Elena, and thank you to all of our um, speakers today. A really insightful and informative um, group of, um, of talks. So we have um, just about 15 minutes for Q&A. So I wanted to, to start off um, with one. And again, thank you for these presentations. And one thing that we noticed that many of you talked about today was the lack of institutional infrastructures to help us work through ethical issues and the need for collective protocols or code of ethics for researchers. So we're, we're wondering what we can do as researchers to, and you got, y'all have mentioned some of the things that you're implementing in your labs and centers, but what can we do as researchers to move more toward uh, more standard guidelines? And feel free, of course, to just um, jump in. I'm happy to kick things off here, um, and particularly because it's sort of quiet at the moment, <laughs> I say as banging starts up again. Um, in any case, I think that there, there are two things um, that we can do to, to help move things forward. Um, I think one is, Meredith, what you, you already pointed to in just asking the question, which is come together as a community and be the force for developing our own code of ethics, our own code of, uh, of conduct and practice. Um, for these things um, and developing um, institutional mechanisms, or developing mechanisms that we can then in turn in institutionalize, um, but among, using ourselves right as the starting point and, and precisely these sorts of conversations as the starting point. Um, the second thing that I think we do have to push for though is for these processes to be formally institutionalized. I don't know. In fact, I'm fairly convinced after working on these issues, both in the US and in Europe now, um, that we're probably not going to get to anywhere near the ideal outcome if these sorts of uh, processes live within our uh, individual research institutions, universities, and other sorts of research institutes. Um, I think it's problematic if we, it would be problematic if we pursue that because, I mean, we've already seen the ways in which it's problematic from, you know, just our, our experiences with IRB, but I think really crucially, we also have to take into consideration the sorts of um, uh, resource inequalities um, that are built into this kind of fractured approach that we have right now. Um, and, and I've really come to believe that we now need a sort of independent um, uh, intermediary body that sits between, um, in, in many instances, the platforms uh, and uh, who would actually be providing the data in some, in some circumstances, right? And then the researchers on the other hand, and can be a locus for review of the processes that are involved on both sides of that equation, allowing us all to get to um, never an ideal state of being, right? This is never going to be a utopia, um, but get to a, a much more efficient and much better um, set of circumstances than we have now. Thank you so much. Uh... Rebecca, I think that's a really fantastic point. Um, does anybody else want to tag in on on this particular question? I think I was going to build off of Rebecca's point there about having an intermediary and how important that is. I mean, there's a it, piece here that didn't come up. We, so many things came up many times. One of the pieces that, that didn't come up here that we've talked about is that um, you know, certain researchers have special access to data based on reputation and other kinds of things. It's a very rich, get richer effect, um, and it's not good for the for the research community. And so, um, and and it's, it, and it puts a little bit of a conflict of interest there because you want to maintain that data coming, and so you may not be as critical of those companies as you otherwise would be. And so, I think it's extremely important that we start moving towards something like an intermediary. Um, organization body that kind of helps not only um, look at the ethical uh, things about how the data is used and how it's going to be 
um, stored and analyzed, but like who gets access and make sure that we get a diversity of researchers able to use that data. And they may even have to start putting in some, some infrastructure to facilitate researchers being able to do that access, because we know that a lot of the rich, richer effect is based on the infrastructure and, and the methodological know-how that one gains from using that data. And so to have some support for a broader array of researchers to be able to access and do these analyses, I think is really important. Josh, yeah. Or Devon, did you, I think your hand went oh. up. Do you wanna go first and then I'll go? Go ahead, Josh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, like, I just wanna give a, a huge uh, push to this too. And it's it, both, yes. I mean, to, to make two points on this one, a huge fan of this concept of third party institutes here. And actually, I want to tell I want to share with our I'll share with everybody here who's here today that about five, six years ago, a bunch of us tried went to Sloan and got a bit of money to try to start scoping out something like this before. And we had a workshop around this idea of, of, of setting up this kind of a third party institute. And we commissioned a whole bunch of white papers. So I've just put the link to those there. Um, we did pull back when Social Science One was announced. Uh, because it seemed like that was sucking all the oxygen, especially the fundraising oxygen out of the room at the moment. And, and in retrospect, I regret that that didn't happen. But there are multiple movements going on right now, multiple efforts. I think what Joe is doing with the Data Collective is like one way of thinking about this. I think what Rebecca is talking about with the European Union, there are a lot of exciting and interesting ideas going on in this. And I think, and I just absolutely agree with everything Kate said. And it's even beyond like the original idea behind this thing, which we horribly called ISOD, the Institute for the Secure Sharing of Online Data, which is a terrible name and acronym. But the impetus behind that was like all the conversations that I felt like I was having with platforms and all this time I was spending and they were like, oh, we're gonna check, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And I was one of the ones who had access to at least talk to people and then they would go nowhere. And the whole idea was that like, we're gonna do better as a field if like a grad student at a university who doesn't have any faculty who are working on this, who doesn't have the kind of infrastructure like the Starbird Lab or like CSMAP, right? To be able to do these kinds of things that that graduate student can still get access to the data uh, and can, is able to do research. Now, again, what these third party institutes have to solve is this trade off between privacy and ethical research and access. Um, the second piece of this I just want to push is that I also think this is about money. Um, and that it is it, the reason that we are getting putting bigger labs together. And I think we were seeing this rich get richer phenomenon with the labs is that this is just research that's hard to do. And I, I can't speak for communications, but I can speak for political science. The traditional framework of political science was you are, a, you are a faculty member. Maybe you hire a couple of grad students to work with you. Maybe you work with a peer, right? Like it's not a lab-based field. And this research, there are just such returns to scale from having labs, right? I mean, imagine what we would be doing in genetics if we had no labs, right? Like there's just so much, you know, these people need to buy hundreds of thousands of pieces of equipment that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in bio labs. And I think, we as a society need to get serious about this because the, the reason that we have bio and chemistry labs all over the country is because the National Institute of Health spends $50 billion a year supporting research. And a ton of that research goes into, your, it goes into universities. And it's great, and people on this call have been instrumental in it, that we have been able to convince some foundations to step into the gap. But ultimately, like societies are gonna need to decide like, our society has decided it's really important to try to understand what you know health issues and we're going to fund a ton of research around this if we think it's really important to understand this digital information age that we're in we're going to need to have more funding and i think directing it through these kinds of third-party institutes that focus on increasing access that's one huge piece of it but also making it so that there's money for lots of people to start up labs the same way we have in bio or chemistry, that's also really important too. So I think that's a piece of the access portion here. Thanks, thanks for that insight, Josh. I think that is really important. I saw Devon's hand come up again. And then once Devon speaks, I do want to um, segue into a couple of audience questions because we have a hard stop at um, 1.15 Eastern and I don't want to ignore these questions. So without further ado. Yeah, just really quickly, the, the, the idea of us being more egalitarian with data sharing, I think there's an inherent tension there. One is institutional boundaries. So we're great about sharing data internally. It become a nexus, a hub for that within our university, right? So we're interacting with psych and social and poli sci and in the med school and, and people in engineering. And that's been fantastic because those institutional boundaries actually encourage that versus 
when our students leave, we have to create special infrastructures to allow them to continue to have data access or have access to those tools until they can build their own infrastructure. But that's the benefit of that network, right? That's not that broad, that broader opening of the data. In places like chess, we've actually had to write that into grants to allow to have built in the infrastructure to go back to IRB to say, we have to add this person to the IRB, here's their clearances, and having time set aside for that because there's interest in those existing data sets or historic data sets. So that's the other thing is building that capability into grants going forward becomes an essential feature of doing this. Now, interoperability, creating a central repository, I think these are all great ideas. I think that has to happen through large scale institutional investment like federal grants. And I think the best way to do that, and I think we're seeing mechanisms now, the reason the med side is so funded is because it's solutions oriented. So much of, of the, the political communication side has been about pointing out the problem, but not really thinking about being solution oriented. And I think that's a huge difference. Thank you. That's a really excellent point, uh, being solutions oriented. So um, very quickly in our last few minutes, I do want to just address some questions that we've had come in from the audience. Uh, Jason Baumgartner asks how we as researchers and data scientists can hold social media companies more accountable for potentially allowing disinformation to spread through their platforms. Do we have an obligation to take some form of action when we find a blatant disinformation? I can just very briefly, I do think we have a responsibility here. Um, you know, most of the platforms have articulated policies against this. So uh, while it often feels kind of lame, um, reporting this content is valuable to platforms. And then, you know, pulling it together so that we have a better understanding of how the networks are spreading, I think it's really helpful too. But yes, I do think we have a responsibility. Fantastic. Been talking to the AD I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. We've been talking to the ADL about trying to, you know, build different kinds of monitoring systems, say, for example, for hate speech or hate symbol use, and to do that in order to compare platforms to say which ones are doing a better job to encourage the platforms that are serving as spaces for that kind of, uh, uh, you know, anti-social uh, kinds of uh, uh, instrumental uses to be aware of that and to try to shut it down. Absolutely. Uh, and then Andre Rodart asks, uh, he says, thanks for the talk. How would the panel respond to the ethical concerns raised by Dr. Starbird around revealing personal information on influential accounts identified in network analysis? Have you been confronted with situations where research findings had a public benefit if revealed in full, but would go against users' individual consent? I see a lot of nodding. Well, just a, 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 this is a hard one because, um, legally they've consented and it's it gets down to to inform consent for for something like twitter they've consented to be on the platform and have it be public and they know it's public where the informed consent comes up is like are they do they understand that their data is public and for those that are manipulating the platform and are high profile we can maybe assume that they understand that their data would be public in a way that, that we might not be able to assume for everyday people. But that is a little bit of, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, gray area in some of those decisions that, that, that we think about. And I think Rebecca had a, had a better way of kind of um, articulating that kind of trade off. Yeah, I think I can say here just really quickly that, that thinking about it, right, when I, in my presentation, I talked about two dimensions that we use for evaluating the, the potential risk, the risk framework here. Um, one of those is the reasonable expectations um, of the users. And if we think about that, at least in part, being related to the relative publicness, um, certainly the reasonable expectations of um, users on Twitter are different from users in their, when they're posting on their own timelines on Facebook, even if they're doing so in a public post. Um, those expectations are different from uh, for politicians and large accounts than they are for the average everyday user. But on top of that, this sort of framework also gives us the, the leverage, the angle um, with which to think about questions um, in terms of, you know, the the intent of the users, including right, the malintent. We can think about the bad actors who are intentionally 
um, spreading disinformation and our, our evaluation of their reasonable expectations fundamentally shifts, as does even right our evaluation of the, um, the potential harms of our research to them. Right? That calculation fundamentally shifts when we think about who the different researchers are, or sorry, who the different data subjects are, and the different types of platforms and spaces in which they're making their data available um, publicly. Thank you. And I see Josh's hand come up. I want to um, just quickly go to you, but I, we, I do have one more very difficult question. I don't think we're going to have time to answer as completely as it deserves, but we do have a hard stop in two minutes. So, Okay, so super fast on this one. I just want to throw out the possibility that we might be overreacting on the other side and that actually people might be really happy to have the data that they've put on the social media used in a way to help keep the social media platforms accountable. Um, and we were sort of like stunned when we ran a consented study where we asked, this was pre-Cambridge Analytica, where we asked people to share their Facebook data with us, so like private posts. And after we read it, how valuable this is and how much people value it, like we, we actually found that like 50% or 40% of our Facebook users on, in this survey were happy to give us all of their Facebook data that we asked for for $5. Right, so maybe that's because we think people value their privacy more than people value their privacy. Maybe because people really didn't even understand what that meant and they, for $5, they were willing to do it. But I think there might be the possibility actually that people would be happy to have their data used for scientific research. I mean, people do all sorts of time, all sorts of times make donations with much more secure things about their much more, you know, bodily organs and things like this to, uh, to scientific research. And so I think it's, it's, it's also in this spirit of trying to understand what our, what our expectations of the subjects are, we could actually go too far in the opposite direction. And it might be that people are fans of citizen science. Thank you so much. And on that note, I want to thank everybody once more for your really uh, valuable insights today and joining us at the conference. We do have one more uh, question from an anonymous attendee, but it's about including diverse communities who have traditionally experienced research harm. And I do not think we can do it justice in the 30 seconds we have left. So I'm really, really hopeful we can address that uh, maybe in one of the breakout sessions later today, because we do have the keynote coming up now, which I believe Joe is going to to um, transition us to. Thanks again, everybody.